It's been called nature's azempic and it's been touted for everything from fighting cancer to alleviating depression. So in this video we'll separate the marketing hype from the evidence-backed benefits and in one instance where I recommend berberine to my patients. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. Berberine is a compound naturally found in several plants and it's been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine to treat things like diarrhea, but more recently it's drawn the interest of researchers for its potential in a wide variety of other areas, so it's being investigated for possible effects on blood sugar control, cholesterol, weight loss, cancer and more. But what does the current research show? How much of this is hype and how much of it is grounded in solid evidence? So let's consider cancer first. In experiments, berberine has shown an ability to fight cancer cells in a petri dish of breast, colorectal, lung, prostate and liver cancers. It also seems to enhance the effectiveness of existing cancer treatments in a petri dish. But the research here is really early. Most of it involves seeing how cancer cells outside the body respond to berberine in the lab. Promising results at this level often unfortunately don't translate into effective treatments when tested in humans. So for now, we need a lot more clinical evidence before we can get too excited. Next, let's consider berberine's impact on blood cholesterol levels. We worry about cholesterol because elevated levels of LDL cholesterol contribute to plaque buildup in our arteries and heart attacks. We know from separate meta-analyses of over 200 prospective cohort studies and randomized controlled trials, including more than 2 million participants, over 20 million person years of follow-up, that the higher our LDL cholesterol levels are, the higher our risk of heart disease. And research has found that berberine acts in several different ways to help reduce LDL cholesterol. It reduces how much cholesterol from our food gets absorbed by the gut, and it also has a dual impact on LDL receptors in the liver. The liver is a key player in how the body regulates its cholesterol levels. It has receptors that pull the LDL cholesterol from the blood. So think of these receptors like little traps specifically designed to capture molecules of LDL cholesterol. The more of these traps there are, the lower our levels of LDL cholesterol in the blood. Berberine stimulates the liver to make more of these LDL receptors, and at the same time, it reduces how much PCSK9 is made. This is a protein whose job it is to break down LDL receptors. So by blocking PCSK9, berberine helps the liver to have more LDL receptors, and therefore the liver can pull more of the LDL away from the blood. So how much does this actually help in practice? Well, a meta-analysis in 2018 looked at the results of 16 clinical trials, and they found that berberine reduced total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, but the overall effect is relatively small. It also gave a slight boost to HDL cholesterol. An updated meta-analysis in 2024 yielded similar results. And there's a caution from the researchers of that 2018 analysis. They note that the underlying trials, there are some issues with quality, and different individual studies had wide variation in the results that they found. This is a point that we'll return to later. Now, unfavorable cholesterol levels are just one component of what's known as metabolic syndrome. It's a cluster of risk factors that increase our odds of both heart disease and developing type 2 diabetes. Other important risk factors are high blood sugar and obesity, and there's been a lot of excitement about berberine's linkages to those two issues as well. Consider blood sugar. One of the most important effects of berberine is to activate an enzyme called AMPK. AMPK acts as a cellular energy sensor. It's like a metabolic master switch, and when it's flipped on, it drives a set of processes to restore the energy balance. Normal activation levels of AMPK help our blood sugar levels remain healthy, but impaired AMPK function is an important contributor to type 2 diabetes, and this is one of the mechanisms for how metformin, a drug that I commonly prescribe at the clinic, works, but I'm mentioning it here again because of how berberine seems to have a similar effect that it activates AMPK. So how much can berberine help? Well, a meta-analysis in 2021 looked at the effects of berberine supplements in patients with type 2 diabetes. 46 trials were included, and they found that berberine lowered HbA1c levels by an average of 0.38. So let me explain what this means. HbA1c stands for hemoglobin A1c, and checking the level in our blood gives us a measure of the average blood sugar level over the past 2 to 3 months, and it's given as a percentage. So a normal level would be less than 5.7%, and between 5.7% and 6.8%, that's what's known as pre-diabetic range, and a score above 6.5% is considered as type 2 diabetic. So berberine shaved 0.38% off the HbA1c scores, so that's a borderline clinically meaningful impact in this context. Next. In that same analysis, berberine reduced fasting glucose and the levels measured two hours after a meal. 
And notice the language the researchers use here. It says remarkably reduced blood sugar levels two hours after a meal. In this analysis, this is the strongest effect, and it compares favorably to the impact of metformin, which again I prescribe commonly to my patients who are pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetic. An intriguing pilot study pushed this even further. It put berberine and metformin head-to-head in a population with type 2 diabetes. Berberine outshone metformin in this trial, slashing the HbA1c by 1.99% versus 1.43% for metformin. So does that mean that it's time to switch from metformin to berberine if we're pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic? Well, not yet, and here's why. While these results are intriguing, there's a big difference between berberine and metformin when it comes to the quality of evidence that we have, and this is important. It's a point that's often lost online when people compare metformin to berberine. We've got much larger trials with better designs and longer follow-up periods for metformin when compared to berberine. For instance, we have a trial tracking the impact of metformin on the incidence of type 2 diabetes over a 10-year time span with thousands of patients. Compare that to the head-to-head trial of berberine and metformin. That trial only enlisted 36 people and lasted just 3 months. Plus, that study is an outlier. The meta-analyses, which group the results of previous studies together, find a more modest impact for berberine. The results of individual studies, they're all over the map. And we could say the same thing about the risk profile. From the results so far, berberine, it does appear to be safe, but we don't have the same level of long-term data compared to metformin. And this is why the clinical guidelines recommend metformin for pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetic patients, not berberine. Metformin is well established, it's effective, and it's safe. And we will circle back to the one instance where I recommend berberine to my patients shortly. For now though, let's look at one last element of metabolic syndrome obesity. Some influencers have been calling berberine nature's azempic for weight loss. And is there any truth to this? Well, a meta-analysis in 2020 looked at the data. It included 12 separate studies on berberine's impact on weight loss, and berberine was found to reduce weight by around 2 kilograms during the study periods. And a more recent analysis, which included even more trials, came up with a similar number. It found that the average weight loss was just under 1 kilogram, though it reached as high as 1.63 kilograms for one subgroup. And that's a relatively small effect. For comparison, let's look at the real Azempic trials. A large randomized controlled trial found that the average weight loss over the 68-week period was 15 kilograms, so that effect size here is dramatically larger. So for patients who are looking to lose weight and are struggling to achieve their goals just through diet and exercise alone, that's when I have a conversation with them about GLP-1 medications. So far, I've focused on berberine's impact on people who are pre-diabetic or have type 2 diabetes. But what about others? So something that's intrigued me about the initial data on metformin was its potential benefits for non-diabetics. So the same question arises for berberine, again, since they both activate AMPK. So let me explain why I was intrigued about that initial data on metformin and whether that translates to berberine. The key promise was connected to aging. So remember how metformin boosts AMPK, just like berberine does. Well, it was thought that this could extend lifespan. The research since that initial promising results, however, they've been disappointing. Metformin, for example, failed to extend lifespan when it was tested by the Meticulous Interventions Testing Program. And in humans, when the Diabetes Prevention Program tested metformin in high-risk individuals but who were non-diabetic, there was no benefit seen compared to a placebo for cancer rates, cardiovascular disease, or all-cause mortality over the 21-year follow-up period. So in other words, the evidence available today doesn't suggest that metformin counters the effects of aging. It just helps to prevent diseases that cause death early. And it's also why it doesn't make sense for someone without those conditions to take it. Particularly since we've now got evidence that metformin can have negative impacts as well. So we'll look at the berberine data shortly, as well as the instance where I recommend berberine to my patients. So in a 2019 study where both groups were exercising, one group took metformin and the other group didn't, and what they could see was metformin seemed to blunt the positive effects of exercise. They only improved their cardiovascular fitness by half as much as those who took the placebo. And that study was backed up by a 2022 study showing the same thing. Metformin can reduce the positive effects of exercise. Metformin also lowers testosterone levels. So does berberine fare any better? 
Well, here the evidence is severely limited, but it looks like we'll run into similar issues when it comes to exercise. A basic problem is this. When AMPK is ramped up, it acts to conserve energy in the body, and one of the key ways it does this is to dial back making proteins. But this is essential to muscle growth, so stimulating AMPK might limit muscle gains. So do we have evidence of this when it comes to berberine? Well, again, we're severely limited, but one study looked at the effects of berberine in mice. Berberine decreased protein building and led to a reduction in muscle growth. On the other hand, a very recent study in mice found a different result. Here, berberine helped prevent muscles from shrinking, but this was in obese mice. So just like metformin, there are benefits for pre-diabetics and for those with type 2 diabetes, but otherwise it might be counterproductive to take berberine. This is why I elected not to include berberine in microvitamin. For otherwise healthy people, I don't want to risk lowering exercise performance or testosterone levels. Instead, here's what I prescribe in my clinic and where berberine fits in. So I need to say up front that we always address lifestyle factors first, like diet and exercise, and getting those things right make a huge difference. But sometimes we need additional help to treat metabolic syndrome and diabetes, and that's where medications have an important role to play. So for controlling blood sugar levels, the first First-line medication is metformin. It's well established, it works, and it's very cheap. But this might be changing soon. GLP-1 medications like Ozempic have a powerful effect on lowering blood sugar levels. The downside is that they're relatively expensive, but as costs come down, we might see that these replace metformin as the first-line medication for diabetic treatment. For now though, however, GLP-1 medications are definitely first choice for aggressive weight loss. They've been a game changer in helping patients achieve and sustain a significant drop in their body mass index. But what about when it comes to cholesterol? Here, the initial treatment for elevated levels is typically a low-dose hydrophilic statin like rosuvastatin 5mg or pravastatin 20mg. Sometimes, though, patients are intolerant to statins and their cholesterol reduction isn't reduced enough. That's when we'll look to add other medications like azetamibe. And just like rosuvastatin, azetamibe is extremely cheap. They're both off-patent. Failing that, we'll move to PCSK9 inhibitors and a new medication called bempedoic acid. But PCSK9 inhibitors, they're very expensive and bempedoic acid is again under patent. So here's where berberine might play a role. If a patient is intolerant to statins and azetamibe isn't quite cutting the mustard and it's not a financial option for PCSK9 inhibitors, then adding berberine can be considered a last resort because the cholesterol-lowering effect is much smaller compared to the other medications that we've got available. Plus, we don't have out data for berberine. We know that statins, for example, lower the risks of heart disease compared to a placebo, but we don't have that same data for berberine. There's another supplement besides berberine that's getting a lot of press, and unlike berberine, it's something that I actually take, so make sure to check out this next video here to find out why scientists are calling taurine the youth molecule and why I personally take it.